Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissonance. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Rob is back in the United States for a week. We have our normal weekly chat about markets and geopolitics. If you want to talk about our wealth management services, our research services, or if you have feedback from some of my initial Mexico conversation or some of the thoughts that I developed on Mexico in the conversation, you want to tell me how I'm right or how I'm wrong, it's jacob at cognitive.investments. Feel free to wear out my email. Cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Rob, nice to see you in uh, in Cambridge, Mass. I see the black background. It looks like you're in Mass. And I also don't hear the French architects uh, making coffee and flushing the toilet and anything else. So most listeners don't get to enjoy that because that gets edited out in the in the process. But usually when we're recording, I get to hear all sorts of interesting noises from the people you share the office with in Paris. Welcome to the United States of America. Thank you. Yeah, there's not nearly <laughs> enough yelling in this country for me. This is my problem. You know, I... Um, I like a lot of things about France and like some of my family still lives in France and things like that. But I will say um, just for, so I'm, I'm a swimmer. I like to swim laps, swim laps every other day. And here in the United States, like if you, if you go to a lap pool um, at the pool that I swim at here in New Orleans, you have to like reserve a lane. And if you jump in somebody else's lane, it's like really it's, it's, it's rude and the lifeguard will get on you. And in general, like there are other pools where, yeah, you'll do circle swimming, maybe three, four people get in the lane, but then it's tapped out and you wait your turn. Um, I will always remember I spent a month in Paris a couple years ago and I wanted to keep up workouts, uh, wanted to keep up working out. And um, I found some public pool. It was like in the basement of a mall or something like that. And I walk in and it was beautiful, but it was like 200 people and it was like 40 people in each lane and everybody just like jamming into each other and like nobody was mad. It was it was just like just an absolute madhouse. And I thought to myself, I, I don't understand. Like they can't be doing this for fitness because you can't go fast because we're all just like dog paddling around in little circles. Anyway, I'm really going off track here, but uh, all of, for some reason, the cacophony in, the, in, in France versus the lack of noise here made me think of that. Um, yeah. All right. Well, a weird way to start. Another weird thing happening today. Look at that segue. I'm so such a professional. Um, oil prices have been doing some weird stuff here. Um, and I, I have to confess, I'm not exactly sure what's going on. We were talking about it a little bit, and I think it's useful to share some of our confusion, but maybe also some, some thoughts about what could be going on. A little bit of a recap. So for the first... I would call seven, eight months of the year, we were fairly bearish on oil prices in particular. It had to do with the Russian oil price cap. It had to do with the fact that OPEC would cut and the price would continue to go down. It looked like OPEC was actually acting out of desperation, not out of, you know, Mohammed bin Salman uh, stringing things together just perfectly. But as we got into summer, you start getting more maybe demand from China. Like we pulled back from that a little bit and just said, okay, like, we, the bearish call was good. Now we're just going to sit and watch this a little bit and see what happens. Um, and then the the narrative last week, well, let's let's go back a month. If you go back to August 24th, we're hanging out at about 79 a barrel for Brent crude. Um, it starts to rise incrementally. And then last week, you get a nice little shot up towards 93, 94. Um, you can go back and look at the articles from last week in Bloomberg and Reuters and everything else. It's oh, We're marching to 100. We're revising back to 100. $100 barrel oil is here. The Russians are getting oil out outside of all the sanctions and things like that. Uh, and then the bag fell out. So we're down. We're recording here Thursday morning. We're down to 83 a barrel. Um, and doesn't look like the bleeding has quite yet stopped. So um, that was surprising for me. I joked to you that I should have kept my bearishness apparently a little bit longer. Um, but d does it surprise you? Do you have any thoughts about how to explain this to the listeners or things that they should be looking at to, to make sense of this particular move? <clears throat> I'll try my best. Um, cause we don't have a position here and, um, it's a, it's a tricky time in oil markets, as you say. Um, a few things that I observe. So the first is this looked like a pretty heady momentum market heading out of the summer. Um, you know, there was, there was some bearishness kind of built into oil and then you really ripped out of this base 
you know, around late June, early July. And since then, it was pretty much just off to the races. You know, you didn't have any very significant pullbacks. Um, and I think sometimes you see, especially in commodity markets where you have a lot of leveraged uh, futures players, you just see um, a lot of uh, positioning uh, build up, people getting over their skis. And so then you have these sell offs, especially against the context of what's happening now, like small cap equities are selling off, riskier equities are selling off. I think this smells like a liquidation. Um, to me, I, d I don't think there's been any fundamental change that's been sufficient to to mark this, and that's hard to to get used to if you're not, you know, in financial markets every day because you look at the newspaper and you say, well, what what the hell happened? Uh, did I did I miss something? Um, <laughs> but you know, this is it's like the elastic band around the fundamentals, and the elastic band was stretched very far in the bullish direction, and, and now somebody uh, appears to have gotten smacked a bit so um that that's kind of the the extent of of what i see going on and as far as you know sort of fundamentals i, I don't think too too much has changed in in our view um but this technically looks more like a a time to be building positions rather than liquidating them because someone is out there liquidating and and really you're just clearing this overbought condition that you were experiencing earlier in the summer and markets are um, sort of settling settling down like these are usually the periods when you want to start taking the opposite side rather than panic yeah and we don't have a position with oil we have had a position in natural gas for a little while and that relationship is not quite as tight as it has been necessarily in years past i need to update my charts over here for the last couple of weeks and see if anything has changed meaningfully in that regard um but I mean, you know, we've been liking the risk reward on natural gas, but we've, as we talked about, oil was sort of uncertain, and it was in that, in that momentum trend, trend upwards. Um, how does this relate back to sort of macro context? Because again, like it's it's amazing how fast financial media decides it wants to shift. Like last week, it's oil hundred dollar a barrel. Oh my God, what's going on? Diesel shortages and everything else. And then this week, it's like, oh my God, bond carnage, blonde, uh, blonde, bond bloodbath. Like everything is crazy. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll let you take a little bit more of a victory lap on, on the bond carnage in general. But it, now the narrative seems to be, oh, macro conditions are so bad that even with, um, you know, the oil situation looking good and looking at $100 a barrel last week, the macro is going to overwhelm it. Um, I have a hunch in, in you thinking that that's a little bit too simplistic and that that's not actually what's at work. Well, I do, because getting back to your point on natural gas, it's interesting that gas prices are up even while oil prices are down. And oil is a very squirrely market because it is macro demand driven, but it's also driven by just miles driven, which has its own weird dynamic of its own that sometimes is not really as tied to the economy. And it's very supply driven. You know, a lot of that movement in price happens because, you know, small changes at the margin and what Saudi Arabia is doing, which, um, which is hard to parse out from the demand equation. Gas is a little bit more of a of a barometer i think and it's interesting that gas prices are um are not going down they're actually going up in the last few weeks uh, so i would be cautious of reading too much uh, from a macro perspective into the the move in oil um because you know at the same time the sort of marginal data that we're tracking or looking at on the macro is getting uh, quite a bit better. I think, you know, if you look at my notebook, which I send out to, to clients every week, um, the things that caught my eye this week were some notable, uh, improvements in freight markets, for example. Um, so rail car loadings, uh, had a little jump in the last few weeks and the first real signs of life for quite some time so that's a long-winded way of saying uh, i don't think oil is necessarily acting as um, a barometer of what's going on in the in the broader economy uh, a lot of this is uh, financially um, oriented um, and it is sort of striking that it is happening at the same time that bonds and uh, high beta stocks are getting puked out <laughs> yeah 
Um, let's before we sort of shift to some other geopolitical things. Let's just talk about the bond carnage in general, because as you said to me before we hit the record button, you're pretty happy about the fact that we sidestepped the bond carnage uh, for clients, and then we got that call right. Um, but that sort of raises the question: Okay, we sidestepped it. What is the next step? Are you going to continue to sidestep? Is there more carnage in store? Uh, Cousin Marco, we recorded yesterday. That podcast will come out Monday. He's still very, very bearish bonds. He thinks there's more room to go down, um, which I was surprised to hear. So um, now that now that we've sidestepped correctly, sort of where and obviously you won't have the decision yet. But where are you thinking right now in terms of next steps um, in that regard? Um, the comparison that I gave when we had our macro meeting internally last week, because we were having this very same discussion, as you know, you were there, was... Um, <laughs> was no, actually, actually the, the, the Chinese Communist Party sent me a, a, an entire recording of the call, so I couldn't make it, but my... my C- anyway, sorry, <laughs> bad joke, go on. Um, the comparison that I used to answer that question was the early 1980s, uh, and, and sort of the 1979 transition when Volcker took over and sort of the irony that when Volcker took over at the Fed and he came out on a Saturday and raised interest rates on a Saturday, I think it was by, it was, it was by 200 basis points or 150 basis points rather than drive bond yields down because people said, oh, you know, the the police officer is here to to lay down the law bond yields proceeded to go straight up for the next 18 months i think it was because it really it signaled oh my god this is a problem and all the things that people were worried about it confirmed their fears and confirmed a change in regime and it took a significant amount of time for him to hammer bond yields lower by raising interest rates and, um, you know, sort of taking that approach. And I think we're in a similar situation now. Um, we have totally sidestepped to this move and we've been very open about why. I don't think we need to rehash that. Um, but we should acknowledge this is, this has been the biggest win that we've had in the last year because it goes, it reflects across so many different strategies for our clients. And, you know, when you look back at a year, there's always the one thing like, oh, 1994, that was the year that bonds got whacked. And 1999, that was, you know, the year when the bubble really got going in earnest. Like, people are going to look back on this period and look at that interest rate shock. Um, so it was the most important thing to get right. And, and, and I think we have gotten it right. Um, but I expect the momentum to continue there, much like it did in the early 80s. Um, if you look at what the Fed is saying and the way that they describe this problem and you really read the speeches, I started talking about this last week and then I think I got sidetracked of some like metaphor about transubstantiality or something. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I yeah. remember falling asleep to that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is what happened. Um, <laughs> what I was going to say is if you actually read what they're saying in the speeches, like they're calling it to question fundamental things about uh, interest rate policy. Like Michelle Bowman, for instance, came out and said, like, we think the mechanism for using rates to slow down the economy isn't working like it once was. I mean, that's a bombshell statement, and no one is talking about that. Um, I haven't seen any analysis focused on that. But the, if you read between the lines, what it means is they think that their, uh, their hammer is less effective, so they need to use it bigger and, and harder and faster in order to try to meet their mandate, which is to, to lower inflation. And that's what they're doing. Um, the other thing that they, that if you read what Jay Powell says over and over, um, it's pretty clear that he's skeptical that the neutral rate of interest is where the consensus thinks it is. You know, if you read their statements, they say, we're well above the consensus view of the neutral rate of interest. And do, do you understand that concept or should I, should I explain that for the I, listeners? I, I get it, but let's explain it. Uh, the neutral rate of interest is basically at what level do you put interest rates that neither slows or accelerates the economy? Mm. And, you know, it's a figment of the imagination because that really, it's a theory that doesn't really exist. But yeah, I was, I was going to say, is this, is this the Goldilocks uh, Grimm's fairy tales or is this, are we still doing macro policy? I don't know. Cause I was, I was reading fairy tales to the the kid last night and it's, I feel like I'm having the same conversation. Now, yeah. So I don't know. 
it's it's like the elusive uh, ghost in the machine that no one no one will ever be able to know what it is but everyone talks about it all the time um but the important thing is not what it is or does it exist it's what do the policymakers think it is and what's becoming more clear is that they think it's significantly higher than it was before and i think this is a realization that is yet to be reflected in market expectations so that combined with the fact that the macro data looks darn good um at least in the u.s uh, especially I, th I think shows that i'm in the marco camp uh for sure well, to, to be clear I, I think marco is in our camp I, but uh, that that's fine. Uh, we can also I, 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 i'd like to go back and see when did marco actually start saying this because uh I don't, I don't think he has a pnl to uh, to worry about <laughs> love you marco um <laughs> But before we uh, before we we close here, just a really really niche joke here. Um, I didn't realize that Paul Volk Volker rolled on Shabbos. So in addition to everything else, he's really he's really offending my sensibilities in many ways. Um, let's turn away that that that's the that's the sort of you know compatriot to your transubstantial whatever transcendentalism transubstantial. I don't know what it is. Okay, so. Um, Let's move on. I want to talk a little bit and this, so sometimes we come to the podcast and I have fully formed thoughts. Sometimes we come and you have fully formed thoughts. Sometimes we're shoot, we're just completely shooting from the hip. And then sometimes like today, I have the beginnings of something in my head, um, but it's not quite there yet. So this will not feel as crisp maybe as things normally do, but it's an idea I'm playing with. I also, I just finished writing a massive report on German deindustrialization. We're going to edit it over the course of the next week and get it out to clients. So I'm also trying to pull my head out of, you know, the, the very the, the minutia of German industrial data and trying to get into some bigger things. But something that's on my mind is that um, Blinken, by the time people listen to this, will probably have already been to Mexico and is meeting with top officials um, in Mexico. He's bringing the attorney general with him. He's bringing um, his Homeland Security secretary with him. They're meeting with the Mexican president and their security secretary as well. Um, if you read all of the U.S. coverage of this, if you read the statements from Blinken and the other um, officials that are going, it seems to be all about drugs and migration. Like that, that is what they're focused on. And those are big stumbling blocks right now in U.S.-Mexico relations. The drugs, it's not necessarily the drug cartels. Um, it's People don't tell the story, but if you actually look at the murder rate, the homicide rate in Mexico, it's been going down the last couple of years. And I've been out on an island saying that maybe we could see violence decline in Mexico, that ironically the consolidation into larger cartels was going to be less violent because you don't have all these turf wars all over the side. Um, but the thing that people are worried about here is not necessarily the drug cartels themselves, but fentanyl. And it's specifically about China making precursors for fentanyl that gets in Mexico. And then Mexico is this country that is flooding the United States with fentanyl and blaming Mexico in some part, uh, in some ways for the drug crisis that is happening inside the United States. And then the second part of this is migration. And this is not just a problem for the United States. It's also a problem for Mexico. I mean, we're talking about, I believe last weekend, 9,000 people, the, the United States recorded 9,000 people at the border just on Saturday alone. Um, the Mexican government has come out this week and said they're they're seeing 10,000 people a day come across their borders. So before they even get um, to the United States and they're dealing with a lot of this migration flow, I thought it was interesting that um, um, a lot of these people are coming overland through through the Darien Gap, which I mean, the, the Darien Gap is the sort of thing that is on those like reality shows like Naked and Afraid, like pick the most inhospitable places in the entire universe and plop people there and watch themselves suffer like Tens of thousands of people are choosing to make a very, very perilous journey. And it's not from any one country. It's Venezuela, Ecuador, Guatemala, Cuba. Like line up a lot of the countries that have been having problems in South America. And you get, you know, this sort of stream of migrants that is putting pressure on Mexico and on the United States. And the thing that I want to focus on here for a second is that in a world where the United States and China are sort of really like decoupling is happening and deglobalization is happening and despite the recent uptick in u.s china relations like that relationship is on a bad trajectory mexico is hugely important for the u.s economy for many states mexico is the largest import and export market mexico provides a lot of our labor market um, especially for low-skilled labor and things like that um, if we want to replace china like mexico is the odds on favor to take up a lot of that manufacturing to reach all of those things like mexico is a crucial um, economic partner for the United States. And it is critical for the United States that it, it really has a good relationship with Mexico. And yet we're talking about drugs and migration. Um, I would even refer you to, um, I, I usually love reading congressional research reports. Um, uh, 
Congressional Research Service reports. This is sort of the think tank for um, the US Congress and their reports are always free and you can harvest their charts because there's no copyright for the US government. It's really lovely if you're trying to do things on the fly. And they put out a recent backgrounder on US-Mexico relations. And again, it's, um, it's an over a 30, 35 page document. Um, the first 23 pages our security and migration. We get all of two pages on US-Mexico trade and economic relations, and then we go back sort of to conclude on security relations in general. And the, the way I wanna tie this all together too, and then maybe Rob, you can help me flesh this out, is there's also a weird historical inversion happening here. Um, one of the best pieces I ever wrote, and I'll, I'll put a link to it. I wrote it for a, a Serbian think tank, I think was what published it. This is, uh, I'm not really that well known now, but I was even less well known when I wrote this, this piece. And it was called the Third Opium War. And it was trying to talk about how, okay, like China and the United States, it's sort of mapping on to what happened between the British and China in the early 1800s, except China is much more powerful. Um, the opium part didn't really play a big piece in that war, but it does play a big piece here now. So let's just do a very brief sort of 60, 90 seconds worth of history. In the 1830s and 1840s, the British were selling lots of opium into the Chinese market. And Chinese people aren't just using opium for medicinal purposes, they're getting addicted to it. There's lots of drug use in China. And we can talk about why that is. Some people say it's because, you know, the Chinese empire was coming apart, nobody respected the emperor, everybody was upset, so they were using drugs. Some just say, well, it was it's an addictive drug and like the British were preying on, on these poor Chinese. Anyway, we can talk about all that other things. It, it became a big problem for China because it caused the price of silver to accelerate. And silver was one of the main sort of currencies that China used because a lot of silver was exiting the country to buy opium or a lot of silver was being buried in people's backyards because the social situation and the governmental situation wasn't good. In any case, silver prices were going up. So it puts all this strain on China. And it's, it's not the primary cause probably of the British Chinese opium wars, but when China says no more opium and throws, confiscates a bunch of opium and throws them in the ocean, that becomes the causes belly for the first opium war and for the beginning of the Chinese century of humiliation, blah, 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 blah. Um, we're sort of inverted here now. So now the United States has a fentanyl drug crisis. We're seeing drug usage rates increase in the United States. We're picking on Mexico and we have Republican candidates, you know, talking, literally talking about invading Mexico or using the US military to go into Mexico to get things under control if Mexico won't have them. Um, it's a lot harder to come by data uh, well, it's not hard to come by data on Chinese drug usage. Whether I can trust the data or not, I don't know. Um, for most of the 2000s and 2010s, Chinese drug use seemed to have been increasing. Around 2019, 2020, the Chinese government cracked down, and China claims that it's been reducing drug usage rates, especially of heroin and things like that, significantly um, over the past couple of years. Um, the point just being here, though, that there's this weird inversion where you know, Britain selling opium into China in the 1840s and how that is part of the Chinese imperial collapse and everything that happens afterwards. And now you sort of fast forward to now and it's so now China is putting fentanyl precursors into Mexico, which is selling them into the US market. And that is becoming this flashpoint between um, the United States and Mexico and also in China. And for me, the key takeaway point here is the United States needs Mexico and it needs to have a relationship with Mexico that goes beyond drugs and goes beyond migration. And it actually has a lot in common with Mexico if it wants to go that route, but that's not the conversation that's being had. And you even have Mexico saying like, hey, this is not our, pro like you're the one consuming the drugs. Like, What do you want us to do? Um, not saying I, uh, again, not weighing in whether that's true or not, but that's the Mexican narrative here. It's, hey, like, we're not doing this. And even if we were, why is this our fault? Like, why aren't we talking about like other issues that are more important? By the way, migration's an issue for both of us. You, like, you're not the only one suffering m with migration. We're having to come up with all these protocols ourselves on our own southern border. Maybe let's work on this a little bit more. So there's that problem in U.S.-Mexico relations. And then there's this weird sort of inverse opium war thing happening b between the US and China. And that's as far as I've gotten, but I know there's something there. So help me flesh it out a little bit, or maybe let's dive into it a little bit. I don't think that the comparison between the UK and China is so far-fetched. And let me explain why, because your story makes sense, I think, if you, um, if you put sort of a trade framework around it or a trade policy framework. And drugs are an interesting area to look at because they're so morally loaded 
And I think they serve as an example of how we tend to view trade in moral terms. So um, before China became an export powerhouse and everyone said, oh, you know, all these American parents started teaching their kids Mandarin because they're concerned that the Chinese are going to outwork us and become uh, rulers, rulers of the earth. Um, if you were to go back 75 years, the common perception of China was that they were lazy. No one wanted to do anything. They didn't know how to make anything. Um, and it was the same with Japan and, and, and similar places. Um, and you have these sort of moral narratives that get attached to trade policies. And drugs is a great example of it, because in that case with the opium wars, it was, oh, these Chinese, they're, they're just addicted to opium because, you know, there's there's just layabouts and no one's excited about the emperor. Like, what, what a bunch of horse shit. Um, the, these trade uh, relationships emerge because of trade policy. And I say that the comparison between the UK and China is not so far-fetched because in many ways, China is playing the same role that the UK did back in the prior world order. Um, previously, the UK was the export manufacturing powerhouse of the world, and they had a series of policies to reinforce that. They had an early lead in manufacturing technology and productivity, and then they, you know, in some, some cases violently, enforced a sort of free trade system designed to reinforce that. And it was a system that was geared toward making things in Britain, exporting them to the empire, but also to other parts of the world, and sucking up uh, raw materials uh, from, from, from other parts of the world to, to feed that export machine. Um, much like the UK was the current account surplus powerhouse of the world, now China is. Mm. And, and this is the data point that I think um, people lose sight of in all the talk of decoupling and trade wars. The Chinese current account is literally today bigger than it's ever been, both in absolute terms as, and as a percentage of global GDP. So think about that. Despite everything, I mean, it was six years ago that Trump was elected and the trade war supposedly began. Nothing has changed. It, it's gotten more ex extended in that in that direction. Um, the Mexico thing is interesting because it shows, again, I'm going to wear my Michael Pettis fan club hat, um, but one of the points that he makes, which I think is a really subtle one, and a lot of people don't follow or, or you know, don't, um, it's, it's sort of not intuitive, is um, trade uh, settles multilaterally. So just because China has the biggest trade surplus in the world doesn't necessarily mean that it's all going directly to the U.S. or that the U.S. has to necessarily match that exactly. Um, they could be providing intermediate goods to Mexico, in this case fentanyl, which then goes to the U.S. But the net can be the same. And even though the U.S. may have the trade uh, deficit with Mexico, you know, we're talking about illegal goods here, so this wouldn't be on the official books, but you know what I'm talking about. It all, it all, it all matters. Ultimately, that's a reflection of China's trade policies, which, you know, uh, uh, benefit manufacturing are geared toward supporting manufacturing, whether it's fentanyl or washing machines or, uh, or, you know, complex robotics. Um, so, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think there it's a similar mechanism at work in both places. And then you have conflict that starts inevitably when things just go too far. Um, when when the the com the country that is the recipi the recipient of uh, sort of the imperialistic and this isn't to say that that's a bad word. China is not being imperialistic, but they're making the decisions about how to manage their policy mix. And those decisions have consequences for everyone else in the world, whether we like it or not. Um, that leads to conflict. And that's, I think, what we're seeing um, in many ways. Um, just like the Chinese were exporting silver, we export U.S. Treasury bonds. It's the same mechanism at work and the same sort of headbutting that you're starting to see. It hasn't led to any meaningful change as we said uh in the short term but in the medium term 
a, a current account surplus has never lasted forever. And Britain did not remain the export powerhouse of the world. Quite the opposite. They, they had their position changed quite a bit. Um, and I would expect that this is the beginnings of the same process. And even though we look at the wrong stuff, we're sending uh, Secretary Blinken down there to talk about drugs and to, um, to uh, sort of wrap the knuckles of, of his Mexican counterparts and, and focus on these specific, very morally charged issues. In the end, it's sort of, it's much more boring, the reality and what drives a lot of these things. And the reality is, you know, doing my uh, Cato the Elder thing again is the Chinese imbalance is yet, this is another manifestation of how that flows out across the world. I agree. And I actually hadn't thought primarily of the UK China comparison in that point of time. But what about sort of the United States China comparison to where is the United States sort of where China was in the early, in the early 1800s? Um, one thing that I forgot to say in, in my sort of lead up to this was if you look at approval ratings for AMLO, Mexico's president, um, he's had a little bit of a drop in the last month. He's now down to 65 percent. Uh, this is at the end of his presidency. Mexico has presidential elections coming up next year. Very critical elections that we should be spending more time talking about rather than all the other things media is focusing on. 65% approval rating at the end of a six-year term. Uh, people like Joe Biden and Donald Trump and Barack Obama and George Bush would kill for 65 at the beginning of their terms, let alone at the end of their terms. And if you look at Morena, which is AMLO's party, uh, he can't run again, but he's sort of choosing his next successor and things like that. The only question is whether they're going to get a supermajority or not, not whether they're going to win. That's what it looks like to me. And that has really big implications inside of Mexico because this Morena party, they have been really changing a lot of economic policy. They've been increasing state control over big sectors of the economy. The military is taking over a much bigger role in the economy and also in policing and things like that. These are major changes. And these changes are going to lead, well, first of all, for U.S. companies or for people who are exporting into Mexico, massive implications. If you're, if you're a U.S. corn exporter, for example, you already know that Mexico has been talking about blocking corn access. You might look at, oh, they're maybe talking about beans. They also want, you know, technology transfer. What about energy? Like all that stuff is there. And then also, if you're inside Mexico too, you're also in this weird situation where geopolitically, the world is set up beautifully for Mexico. I was joking with you earlier this week, like, I don't think Mexico's had this much leverage over its neighbors since Santa Ana. I mean, this is like an incredible opportunity for Mexico, and it doesn't come around very often. And it's happening at the same time, that the Mexican government is exerting a lot more control over the economy. So if you're an entrepreneur in Mexico, if you have business in Mexico, you're now going to have to thread this needle between, okay, I have tremendous economic opportunity, but I also have a state whose eye has been cast much deeper on me um, and who is thinking more about how you know national resources should be used towards things like sovereignty and things like that. And that's a, a, a point of contention too. I said that um, AMLO's approval rating was 65%. Uh, Joe Biden's right now on 538 as of what is that? As of October the 5th, when we're recording, is it 40%? And that's actually a little bit up. It, it tanked all the way down to sort of 38% in, in May and June. So the, the point I'm also just making there is I, I don't think we're looking at things from Mexico's perspective, and I don't think anyone is looking at things from Mexico's perspective. We're looking at Mexico and seeing drugs, and we're seeing migration, and we're not actually seeing there are huge changes happening in Mexico, and that this Mexican government that Blinken is going to tangle with has the overwhelming support of the Mexican electorate behind it. Whereas Blinken cannot claim the same thing in the United States. And most Americans, if you poll them, are pissed off about the border, are pissed off about drugs, and pissed off about the economy in general and the direction of everything else. So you have a weak American government that is pretending like it's very strong, going and lecturing a very strong Mexican government that is making major changes. And that, honestly, more than US-China, like if you're an actual like small business owner, or if you have exposure to Mexico, if you're like reshoring factories to Mexico, that is orders of magnitude more important in the US-China trade war or probably anything else that anybody else is talking about. And like, I have to struggle to get information on it. I have to go translate, you know, Mexican newspaper articles just to get a sense of what's actually going on inside Mexico. There's a fundamental disconnect there, which again, rounds back to that question. Um, is, is it too sensationalist to say that the United States is showing that sort of late period political instability that the Qing dynasties were showing in the 1830s and 40s? Is this just, you know, it's politics and this is how it works in the United States. And if, if the Qing dynasty was the Qing 
the Qing Republic, <laughs> maybe they would have been exhibiting similarly. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with that portion of it too. So tell me if I'm, if I'm going too far in making that comparison. Well, I think there's two um, general strains of thought I want to pursue with that. Um, the first is on the Mexico situation specifically. Um, we tend to view things in a simplistic way from the point of view of the U.S. Or, or Europe and not think about Mexico as it is. But I think it's a very good point that you make about the, the role of the Mexican state. And um, it's funny, we talk about book reading and why it's actually important and how like usually on a day-to-day -day basis it doesn't do anything for you. But I'm, I'm reading a giant thick book about the English Civil War right now. And I think it's a very interesting comparison because if you look back at that point in England's history, they entered this period of great instability and uncertainty. And the revolutions of the 1600s in England were really about what you're describing with Mexico, which was, hey, we need to expand the size of the state. We cannot, you know, we need to provide centralized services, centralized military. And it was about the struggle between the center, between parliament, who's going to determine how those assets get seized and utilized for the public good. Is it a centralized system like France? Is it going to be a you know decentralized one like the Netherlands? Um, and that led to massive upheaval. And what you're describing in Mexico is a similar sort of process. One of the major issues with Mexico is so many people work outside of the formal sector of the economy. The tax base of the country is not particularly wide or deep. Um, and yet they're growing into this role that is a more developed country role. And especially as they go from strength to strength, from a manufacturing standpoint, from a, uh, an export standpoint, these are the questions they need to hash out. And um, that's going to be a very volatile process if you look at history and sort of the way this has played out elsewhere. It's, a, it's sort of the natural you know, pangs of adolescence. Um, so that, I think, is a, is a major theme to focus on from uh, specifically with regard to Mexican politics and how, uh, how these, uh, these conflicts are resolved. And it's probably not going to be an easy or slow process, but it's probably the story of the next 15 years in Mexico. Um, the other thread I wanted to go down, and then we can return to this, is, you know, is the U.S. Uh, like China in the 19th century? Um, I think there's a big difference between the two, uh, which makes the comparison not particularly apt. So aside from the fact that in terms of relative strength, it's, it's a very different beast, of course. Um, I think the, the better way to think about that is more in terms of structures, uh, trade structures. So the US was, it is a current account deficit country. We absorb trade from the rest of the world. Uh, China at that time was in the same position. Um, but I think the, the big difference uh, between those two is the U.S. is also the hegemon. And China obviously was not. China was the, the, the smaller power that was being bullied around by, uh, by the Germans and, and, and the British and the French. And that's really important to remember because the U.S. and, you know, we are entering a multipolar world. The U.S. is still the most powerful country in the world. And we're still, you know, in the evening time of that U.S. power structure. Um, but the U.S. hegemony was so unique. And if you compare it to the British, it was so unique. Because as I said, the British, their empire was based on, we're going to manufacture stuff and, and ship it out to these places that are sort of under our thumb. We're going to run the current account surplus and, and you know, take advantage of raw materials elsewhere. The U.S. does the exact opposite. We are not exporting capital elsewhere in the world as an expression of our power. We're importing. We're like the nice hegemon. We're, we're nice because we're, we allow other countries to pursue their own policies. We allow China to pursue its own policies. We don't, we don't have troops in China, and we didn't 20 or 30 years ago when China was, was relatively weak. We don't tell China what to do. We don't tell Japan what to do, even though we kind of do, but we, we haven't changed their economic system in all these years. Um, sure. 
that's a big that's a big difference because those countries can pursue mercantilist policies and and sell into us uh, because we're you know a different kind of power because we're more accommodating because uh, we're we're willing to absorb those deficits as a society at least for now um, but that's the big difference is Britain was actively pursuing this sort of mercantilist export oriented dominance and our dominance is a much more um, a much more accommodating and and liberal one in many ways because we're not interfering um, and that has its natural end point uh, and over the long term, it, you know, one of the consequences is likely that the dollar has to go significantly lower in order to redress that balance. But we're not there yet. We're not even close to there. But that, I think, is a, is a big fundamental difference when you think of the two eras and where things go from here. It's funny you say that. I feel like the question that I get the most often when I do presentations now in front of audiences is about the U.S. role as a reserve currency. Um, it actually happened... Um, at an event, was, I've lost all sense of space and time. I can't remember if it was last week or two weeks, but um, I actually, I, I only had, I usually have an hour to talk. I had 45 minutes. So I cut out the currency stuff because I was like, well, if I, if I keep the currency stuff in, this like, that's another 10 minutes right there. So anyway, the first question, of course, was tell me about the US role as a dollar reserve currency. And every time somebody asks that question, they, they're scared that the US is losing its position as a dollar re reserve currency. And my answer is always in two parts. The first part is, don't worry. It's not going anywhere. Uh, the pound, it took World War I and World War II to unseat the pound. So that's the sort of systemic change you need. If you're worried about China, their share of foreign currency reserves are roughly the same as the Canadian dollar. So unless we're freaking out about the Canadians, like let's just chill out a bit about the yuan and everything else. Um, but the second part of it is you want the dollar to go. You don't want to be the reserve currency. You want the dollar to go down. You want the benefits that that's actually going to give your business probably. Have you ever stopped and thought that maybe it's not such a good thing? You've been told the story about the reserve currency over and over. And you know that I have my disagreements with Pettis, but that's where I'll also join the Pettis fan club. He's He's been banging that horse for a long time. And on that part, I really agree. And then just to sort of round off what you were talking about, you're absolutely like Mexican democracy is incredibly... Um, and I, I don't use these words pejoratively. It's it's juvenile. It's immature. Um, Mexican democracy, like real democracy, where you actually have like candidates that are running against each other, goes back to 2000. The pre was the, the the single party dictatorship of Mexico from roughly the 1920s all the way up to 2000. And it's not until you get Vicente Fox and Pan that comes in that you have the real beginnings of Mexican democracy. So we're talking about a country where democ democracy in, in real terms is 23 years old, 24 years old. So go back to 1776 and fast forward 23, 24 years and look at what US politics was like 23 to 24 years into the democratic experiment. And that is one of the most important things here. Is Morena just gonna become another version of the pre? Are we going back to Mexico's cycles of these dictators coming in and creating parties and structures around them and then it gets unraveled and then comes back together? Or is Mexican democracy here to stay? Is it gonna assert itself against it? AMLO hasn't been able to do a lot of the things that he wanted to do because he's been blocked. He hasn't quite had just enough support to get things through because of the way Mexico works. You need constitutional referendums to change lots of things. And he doesn't have the supermajority right now. And he wasted it when he had it for the first three years. So those are all things that matter. Um, it also goes back to your point about you know freight and inventory and things like that. This was a story I missed last week, but I think it's really important. Um, apparently there's there's a buildup of something like 8,000 or 9,000 trailers trying to get in from Mexico to the United States at El Paso, one of the biggest border crossings. Um, they're talking about maybe a billion dollars worth of goods that is just stuck there at the border because they're having to do all these migration checks because migration really is an issue and because Mexico and the United States are not coordinating. Instead, they're just yelling at each other about the issue rather than actually doing things together. Um, that in and of itself is important. Um, apparently also lots of companies are now trying to say, well, can I go to Arizona? Can I go to New Mexico? Are these border crossings less trafficked? And I'm, can I move things across? And there's some interesting, people don't normally do geopolitics within countries themselves. Um, but I think there is something to be said for, are there opportunities now for Arizona and New Mexico against Texas, which is also solidly sort of in that, you know, berate Mexico, wrap Mexico's knuckles, be angry about migration, get the Texas Rangers out there and do business. Whereas like Arizona and New Mexico, not the main transit points for lots of things. Hey, we're, we're here. We're going to, I think New Mexico was talking last year about expanding um, their supply chains into Mexico as well. So, um, 
I don't know, just a couple more thoughts that are there. Anything else on that? And like I said, listeners, that's, this is the beginning of something for me. You just watched like the, the beginning of a research process, not a fully formed thought. So if you didn't like something I said or something was wrong, actually, if something was, I don't care if you didn't like what I said. If something was wrong, please write in and let me know. Um, and otherwise, hopefully I'll be a little crisper for you as I, as I sort of whittle this down. Anything else you want to say on this, Rob, before we turn to our last topic? And this will be fairly brief uh, because you have to go and also because I'm not, I don't know that there's a ton to say about this, but it did strike me as particularly important um, on our knowledge platform for, for people who aren't engaging with it. We rank every single item by a three, two, or a one. And I very, very, very rarely use a one. If I put a one on an item, it means I want whoever's reading the knowledge platform to stop what they're doing and read it immediately. Twos are sort of, hey, get to this at some point in the next couple of days. And threes are FYIs, this is important, but you don't need to stop. I very, very, very spartanly used the one. I used it for today for an industrial defense forum that is happening in Ukraine this week because there was a lot of interesting things happening there. Ukraine is talking about how um, they're in survival mode and that they need to become a producer of their own weapons and ammunition. Um, and you've got major defense delegations from the Czech Republic, from France, from Germany, from the UK, talking about building facilities inside Ukraine to build these things. You've got Ukraine saying out loud, we don't know that we can depend on our European and American partners for weapons going forward, so we really have to start building our own capacity. If you've been listening to me for a while, you know that this is the big problem for Ukraine. They cannot produce their own weapons, and that makes them completely dependent on Europe and completely dependent on the US. Um, for defense and for also pushing this counteroffensive against Russia. Now, the flip side of that is that Ukraine was for a long time the industrial giant of the Soviet Union. This is where heavy machinery was produced. It's where engines for Soviet helicopters and Navy ships, even nuclear, you know, um, Technology, all these things happened in Ukraine. This was one of the more advanced parts of the Soviet Union. It's why Russia wants it back, probably, because the land is so rich and fertile and the people are so smart and it adds such things there. So it's not completely unrealistic to say that Ukraine could do this. Um, but it really does, I think, track with, with what we've pointed out over the last couple of weeks, which is poll numbers in the United States and poll numbers in Europe are flagging. They're starting to go down in terms of support for Ukraine. If you've been paying any attention to the U.S. election rhetoric or um, you know, what happened with Speaker McCarthy this week or the debates within the Republican Party and between Republicans and Democrats about funding Ukraine indefinitely. Ukraine is watching all that. And they've basically, I think they had an oh shit moment this week. And they said, we really need to make sure we can arm ourselves as quickly as possible, which is exactly what I would have advised them to do um, when those poll numbers first started to flag. Um, it's important geopolitically. It'll be important to watch their progress. It's also important from an investment perspective in terms of like European defense and industrials. Uh, maybe Germany's not going to go to 2% of GDP for themselves. But I guarantee you German companies are salivating at the prospect of, you know, indefinite supply contracts for a Ukrainian military that's going to be in a war of attrition against Russia here for years going forward. Um, also, this sort of dovetails with this. Um, the European Union apparently is negotiating with Hungary about unlocking um, somewhere between nine and nine and 13 billion euros of um, economic support that's been held up over rule of law concerns in Budapest. Um, but the, the quid pro quo is going to be, Hungary, you need to drop any, any qualms you have about welcoming Ukraine into the European Union. And there's a lot to take apart there, too. Like, from our thesis perspective, you don't want to see the European Union bending to a country like Hungary on some of these issues if Brussels really is emerging as its own voice. At the same time, uh, it's probably worth more than $13 billion for the prospects of the EU in general to get um, Ukraine into the bloc. And I also can't help but think, you know, we've, we have these reports about Germany and France talking about plans to reform the EU and maybe different circles of membership within the EU. So you don't need Orban to sign off on every single little decision. All that sort of works into it as well. And you see this kind of push that, yes, we want we want Ukraine in the bloc and we want to build the weapons there. We don't want to be the ones building the weapons. We want to use all these things together. So just an interesting cocktail of things in the Russia-Ukraine war that I think is worth um, worth just spending a little bit of time on. And positive for the broader EU thesis, I think, if you just look at it from the sense of um, historically empires that were growing had an expanding militarized frontier and when they were shrinking, they had a shrinking frontier. And EU in, in, in that light is expanding. Um, 
I mean, uh, whether you whether the Ukraine has realistic prospects of entering the EU in the near term is um, is a complex issue. But the fact that it's even um, entering the 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 Overton window of conversation is pretty important. I think I don't know. And it's it's not just Ukraine. I mean, we, all this weird stuff about Serbia and Kosovo and the Western Balkans and accession to the EU there. Even the South Caucasus, we have mostly focused on Armenia and Azerbaijan from a Russian perspective, from a Turkish perspective, even an Iranian perspective. Europe's looking at that too. Georgia's been trying to get get in the back door of the EU for a long time, and maybe you finally have. Um, the European Union looking across and saying, well, there's also some land there and some millions of people there. And that seems to be up for grabs too. Uh, not to mention, I mean, it's been a fairly abysmal record in North Africa and Western Africa, particularly for France, for France in this regard. But when you look at, you know, the Europeans were the ones who pushed for the Libyan in invention. The United States had to come finish the job because they didn't have the militaries to push it through. But like that was Europe that was thinking about Libya and where they wanted to be there. Uh, France is the one that was supposed to be in Niger and a lot of these countries that have seen these things. So yeah, maybe it will fail, but I take your point. You are seeing an expansionary EU, even if it, even if it isn't going well. But um, as, as we push forward here, I think with Ukraine, I, I would just really like, the battlefield is important. What, what happens inside Russia is important. What happens with Ukrainian elections, whether they happen around the port, but there's probably no more important thing than whether Ukraine can do this and whether they can start producing ammunition for themselves here over the next six to 12 months. It's not unrealistic, but it will take, um, you know, it, it'll take a major, it'll take a lot of capital and more importantly, a lot of good policy to happen. And if Ukraine can do that, it's very, very positive, both for Ukraine and for the EU in general. And if they can't, the clock is ticking. I think it's worth pointing out as a last thought, the common thread between the two stories today the US and Mexico on one side and the EU and Ukraine on the other. In both cases, we're talking about, you know, a, a, a frontier nation imp increasing manufacturing in order to mm -hmm. supply both itself and the dominant sort of sphere of, of, of power in its, uh, in its local neighborhood. And whether it's on the Texas or New Mexico border or whether it's, you know, sending stuff from Ukraine to Poland you know the ability to lower the barriers and improve the the linkages and the infrastructure to move this stuff around will be an interesting thing to watch as um these multipolar spheres kind of coalesce and, and expand right is that too highfalutin no that's that's literally perfect i couldn't have summed it up better myself <laughs> Um, all right, we got to get you out of here for your meeting, Rob. So uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, you'll be back with the French banging around. So we'll look forward to seeing you then. Yep. Plenty of yelling. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.